hope is not a positive course of action. <laughs> it is also not, not a method of separation, right? So when someone asks, what separation are you using between these two planes? No one says hope. <laughs> Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your hosts, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, clear visual runway 23 left, connect hour. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 Area's miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, let our contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received, squawk via fire, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Trun Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach, Skyhawk runway 23 left. to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east, maintain special Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Trun Alpha, this is Triad Approach, on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed, say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. Monday, March 13th, 2022, episode 271. On today's show, we'll talk about the anatomy of a squeeze play, supersonic flights out of the triad, and more of your awesome aviation questions and feedback. What's up, Paige? Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is very how happy. Was, how... How was your work week last week? I it was short, four days. Oh yes, which, is, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, fairly uneventful. It was it was good. It was good. Moderately busy. How's the, wood, how's the chessboard project going? Uh I'm done with. The squares. They have borders to put on and a drawer to make underneath it. Uh, I'm far from done. Hmm. Are you I sketching might... this up? Uh, no. Well, in my brain. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I did uh, get the lathe set up today and uh, practiced turning a little piece of cherry mm. just to see how that went. It went well. That was fun. I made a total mess. So hold on. The bottom part of the piece is round. That's what you're turning. Uh, no, I put a piece of square. The bottom part of what piece? The chess piece. I mean, the character or the... They're mostly round. The whole thing. Okay. Uh, the, the knight is obviously not round... Um, there, but most of the rest are are basically round, with the exception of the cross on top of the king. Uh, there's there's not a lot of like shaping and cutting you have to do afterwards. Just are you doing this alone? No, no, my oldest. This was her idea. She wanted a chessboard, Mm. so. She's helping. Good. I'll teach her how to turn. Yeah. Uh, Last night was the first night of my week. It was very slow because the weather's terrible. We're in that... Well, this winter's actually not been terrible with weather. This week, we had... Actually, we woke up yesterday. There was like an icy, snowy mix on the ground. It was gross. 
that pretty or, much makes everyone not want to fly. Yeah, that was the first. Here, uh, yeah, that was the first of that we've had all all winter. Any yeah, I don't remember winter. another snow. Wintry precip. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh, that made work slow. Tonight we'll work together together again, and we have a normal week of work. We have a lot to talk about: announcements, and right. timely feedback. It's a busy show. All right. Shall we begin? Sure. Ready. All right. Since OB270, we have a ton of new patrons in the show listeners here. Lima Sierra, Tango Charlie, Tango Alpha, and Alpha Romeo. November Lima, Tango Golf Mike, up from the show listener tier, are new in the show supporter tier with Bravo Charlie. We have a new patron in the show maker tier, Delta Kilo, and two new Supreme Galactic Aviation Commanders. Juliet Juliet moved up from the show supporter tier, and Juliet Whiskey. Welcome. Thank you for signing up to support the show. If you would like to learn more about that, check out patreon.com slash opposing bases. If you haven't done so already, leave us a review and a five-star rating and hit subscribe or follow on your podcast player so our episodes are waiting for you each week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Reviews and announcements. Reviews and announcements. <laughs> uh, we'll split up the announcements. How about you get the review? Or I can. Your choice. Well, I always do. You do have the review. Why don't I get the review once? Okay. Go ahead. It's about you. Oh. It's about you. <laughs> Five stars from Utah Pilot 3233. Must be your phone number. AG needs TSA pre-check in his life. <laughs> yeah. What can I say? RH and AG, or is it RG and AH, are truly great dudes in make-believe and reality. Hmm. Did I put the emphasis in the right place there? Um, I feel like you emphasized reality too much, um, because really all that matters is make-believe, is how we appear in make-believe. Okay. I've met them in person a few times, or have I, at the great place that is Oshkosh. They are very passionate about what they do, and very, and we are lucky to have them pass their expertise down to us. AG, I do have to say, though, get pre-check, and your travel experience will be forever changed when you don't have to resort to plastic belts and shoes. <laughs> I don't think either one were plastic. Lima, Sierra Lima from one of the frozen Dakotas. Thank you no. for the review. I do wear, I I do have a belt that the buckle is plastic. Um, right, but you didn't have plastic shoes. No, you had to take. I mean, I had to take the shoes off, but they're slip-ons when I travel. They're slip-on <laughs> shoes. I mean, it's very old manish, but it's comfortable and easy. Okay, I'm not judging. Okay. I keep saying I'm going to do pre-check or the other one. Is it clear? I don't know what the com competition, what what sort of implications for each one, but I'm going to do it eventually too. Yeah. So, so you know, I could, I could have done it like forever ago through the army and it's super easy. Like mm -hmm. you just go and, and put in your ID number and you're basically done. There's really nothing to it. Um, you're sort of automatically accepted. Um, I just never really travel enough, you know, to like to really care. Mm -hmm. So anyway. All right. I'll start these announcements. How about that? All right. Um, I'll get number two, three, four. You get one and five. How about that? All right. All right. Uh, I'll save the applause for the end. Patron golf kilo. Got their commercial glider rating a couple of weeks ago. Comanche Sue, aviation taxologist extraordinaire, got her CFI glider rating. Nice. And PayPal supporter Delta Foxtrot passed their private pilot check ride. Congratulations, everybody. And thank you, Delta Foxtrot, for the one time altimeter setting drop on PayPal. That is not the first time that someone has done that with the expect or the exact number of their altimeter. I like that. Ah. 
I didn't like that. So, congratulations. Those are all big all right. deals. Hmm. I'm doing one. Yeah, one in five. One in five. Number one. <laughs> Have we made this announcement publicly? I don't. I think we talked about it before we hit record one day. This is, I think, our first official recorded introduction of this information. All right. RH is going to be a controller at Sun and Fun in two weeks. This is where you put the applause thing in. So congratulations on getting picked up for that. Uh, Thank you. Everybody wish him luck. He's going to need it. I'm going to need it. (laughs) Yes, I leave Uh, in two weeks from Saturday. If anybody's flying there, please do not say it's RH working. Yeah. This will draw a lot of negative attention. Yeah, he as a rookie too. He he's not gonna want. He's he doesn't need that. I'm lucky if they let me hold the microphone a couple times. Please do not do that. Maybe you'll see me on the grounds. Uh, We have free reign during the air shows to you know roam about and in our time off. I think most of the shifts are split. Start the day in one place, go to a second place the the remainder of the day. Schedule super confusing, but. If you want to run into me, maybe we'll figure out a way to make that happen on my day off down there. Have one day off, we'll make that announcement later on. So, Cool. Cool. All right. Number five. Uh, We have been made, uh, I don't know, honorary? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Members of COPA, the Sears Owners and Pilots Association. Obviously, neither of us own a Cirrus, um, but we did contribute some articles to their publication, Mm -hmm. Uh, and they extended this uh, membership to us, which was very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. This is from Patron Echo Golf, the president of COPA. The Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association, effectively known as COPA, is a nonprofit global organization made up of over 6,300 pilots, pilots, enthusiasts, and industry insiders. The mission of COPA is to educate, promote the safety of, and support the owners, pilots, and those interested in aircraft manufactured by Cirrus. So, ownership of a plane is not uh, a requirement for membership. Correct. We, Mm -hmm. We encourage ownership, promote goodwill toward the general aviation community, and to provide social and safety activities for its members. There are a number of benefits of being a COPA member. These include the magazine, uh, 12 monthly issues a year covering all things Cirrus and COPA, uh, from travel, maintenance, instruction, equipment reviews, and more. Uh, That's where our articles appeared. It is a fantastic magazine. It is very, Mm -hmm. very well done. Uh, It looks great. The photos are great. I mean, it's just a really quality uh, product. Um, the forums, the COPA forums, millions of posts on various topics, uh, the pilot proficiency program, uh, where Arch was a guest speaker in, uh, last year. And you could check yep. out the, you could check out their website, uh, for more details, uh, cirruspilots.org. So again, thanks to COPA for, uh, making us members. Yeah, if you're interested in learning more, the full write-up is in today's show notes. Thank you again. All right. Timely feedback. Timely feedback. (laughs) Were you in the middle of a a swig of beverage? (laughs) Yes. You surprised me. Okay, you... You just talked. There are three of these. Uh, the last one's audio, so we really don't, but we'll share. I'll do the longer one. I'll do number one. How about that? All right. All right. From SCAC Patron Sierra Echo. Hello there. Let your heart palpitations. I re- went back and listened to your quote was, I'm having heart palpitations. Let's move on. We were talking <laughs> about this mist. Uh, let me get it up on the screen here. Hold on. I got to hit a few buttons to make this happen. There, there's the procedure. I'll zoom in. Can you see that? I can. 
Okay. I'll let your heart palpitations be stilled as we further examine the approaches into the Delta under the Coffee Bravo. You have correctly identified the challenge. In the most common configuration, there are two parallel landings active at the Coffee Bravo airport on top of while the approaches are happening in the Delta below. In fact, it is common for approaches to be happening simultaneously to the Delta underneath the overlying approaches into the Bravo airport without lateral separation. Apparently, there's sufficient vertical separation between the approaches if you don't blast upwards on a missed approach from the Delta. Lateral separation is only applied if there's a heavy going into the Bravo, in which case the Delta approach procedure is delayed behind the overlying heavy. This is a rule we haven't really talked about in, in a long time. Um, uh, any, almost any size airplane behind a heavy in their flight path has to be separated laterally by about a half a mile or a thousand feet vertically so you don't get washed away with their wake turbulence. So Sierra Echo continues. It is also important to note that Delta missed approach notes say that a descent may be necessary during the missed approach if you start your missed approach early. That would probably be rare, um, but it could happen. If you go missed early, then you must swoop down to 1,500 feet and under the overflying approach into the Bravo Airport. In addition to grass cutting and birds in the area, the Delta ATIS now also includes a message that missed approaches must cross the field no higher than 1,500 feet. And no, the controllers will not immediately turn you off the missed approach procedure. A large ridge to the east and the Bravo Airport to the west makes that a bad idea. The direction of the missed approach procedure is the same as the most common departure procedure and really is the only way out to the south. Okay. Local tribal knowledge also tells us when you climb out on the mist to the intermediate altitude, you need to be thoughtful about the aggressiveness of your climb. Even if you intend to stop at the climb at 1,500 feet, a fast closure rate with an aircraft above you can trigger a resolution advisory, which ruins everybody's day. Yes, that's why we got the help palpitations about this. Um, there are certain <laughs> parts of this scenario that if they unfold perfectly in a bad way, I don't know that you could actually preclude that. That might happen regardless with the RA. The one on top would feel would sense that threat and probably be told to climb. Um, anyway, to answer your question about what you will see on the instruments on the flight director, the localizer needle senses normally throughout both the approach and the miss procedure. No fancy button pressing required, just stay on the localizer. One thing that can be helpful is the use of VNAV if your system supports it. With VNAV active when you're flying the missed approach procedure, your FMS will hold you below 1,500 feet until you're on the departure side of the Bravo Airport. Both lateral and vertical guidance are helpful on the miss. Thank you, Sarah Echo, for the local insight. We're going to hear more about that in a minute with some audio. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. One You're watching it on the screen. One th um, important aspect that we've touched on before, but we haven't probably in a while uh, that he brought up is the closure rate. I wish more uh, jet pilots understood that. Um, that you know, the faster you're going, that that descent angle is projected out through where you're actually stopping, right? So TCAS doesn't know that you're stopping at 1,500 feet. And mm -hmm. so frequently, even when provided 500, the, the required 500 foot separation from a VFR or even 1,000 feet from somebody else, from another IFR, we'll get these jets on this crazy descent and they hold that descent rate super high until the end and mm -hmm. that frequently results in a TCAS RA uh, when there was no loss of separation but now and the reason controllers hate this is that one it's an MOR they're going to listen to the audio and they're going to listen to the five minutes before and five minutes after you know and if you said anything wrong about anything, it's just another reason for somebody to go digging around and say, oh, you didn't dot your I and cross your T, you know, over wow. here. And so that's that's where controllers, you know, sort of have um, beef with unnecessary, completely unnecessary TCAS RAs. And one of the weapons they have at their disposal, which they would not in this case, 
would be to stop airplanes more than the required separation in a, when you have them climbing and descending you have them both stopping at 2,000 feet apart or 1,500. That's yep. You can't run like that all the time. You'll bury yourself in extra work. But sometimes there's time to do that, and you're not delaying a descent too far into the approach phase or the en route to approach phase, and, and you can afford to do that. But you can't do that in this case. So Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You want number two? Number two. From Patreon Bravo Sierra to the serious one and the enabler of unables. <laughs> hoping, <laughs> hoping while you read this, you both are on level five of the happy grumpy scale. I think that is the desired level. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. I would have to think about that. Uh, I wanted like to write middle? in to say that, huh? It's like in the middle of the scale? Yeah, you're in the middle of... You're not... You're not all the way grumpy, and you're not all the way happy. Okay. I, I could see that. I could see that. Uh, I wanted to write in to say that the next, that next to the ODP series, this one was one of the best. Throughout my pilot journey of 800 plus hours, it has taken me a long time to really be able to read the controller room well. There uh, were a, there was there was a co one comment that I wanted to highlight. AG mentioned that the toughest thing to teach a new controller is how to read the room. I think this applies to new pilots as well. I think student pilots who are scared or reluctant to talk to ATC is because they fear they are going to be yelled at by a grumpy controller. It would be helpful for them to understand that most of the time controllers aren't grumpy. They are just busy and trying to be efficient. Here's my solution to the problem. We need to get the Opposing Basis podcast part of the private pilot license criteria <laughs> to get your license. New pilot candidates must subscribe and, at a minimum, listen to this episode. On a side note, thanks for the introduction to the A80 contact. Hoping to get off Obingo moderating probation soon. <laughs> Bravo, Sierra. Yeah, The committee is still... Uh, looking into that <laughs> i hope the best for you and uh the uh probation in your probationary period uh but you know procedures are what they are um <laughs> as far as as far as the podcast being required um we would love that too it should happen it, yeah. it has to happen I will add to something you said about teaching the new controllers. I think what you're trying to draw is a comparison. It's hard for the pilots also when they're early in their flying careers to read the room and not take things personally or kind of accept that we all have our different paces and tones. That comes with time and experience, calendar time. Not necessarily more hours in the airplane, but time to go home and think about that and hear stories of other people flying and listening to things that you hear on this show when you thought that was, I'm the only person that ever happened to. No, probably not. <laughs> yeah. It probably happened to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, so it's good. All right. Yeah. The last one is audio from SCAC patron, the original Mike Sierra. They spoke with a local pilot and we got them recorded with a little bit of information about the Coffee Bravo. This is a flying legend, Bravo Whiskey, up in the area. Everybody knew who this person was. Thank you for sending in audio. We're going to play that. No one ever flies the complete published miss on the ILS runway 14 right at Boeing Field. Controllers here tell me that, in fact, no one has ever flown the entire published miss. In the real world, unless you are lost comms, Seattle Approach vectors you back for another try or sends you on your way to an alternate. Note that the missed approach procedure was changed in December 2022. You still track the localizer back course, but in the front course direction, to the IBFI 9 DME fix. At that point, you turn southwest and climb to 5,000 and intercept the Seattle 168 radial outbound and finally hold at a fixed 25.8 nautical miles south of the VOR. The key issue if you do go missed is to fly no higher than 1,500 MSL until you reach Okazi. That maximum altitude is to protect traffic passing overhead into Seattle. The restriction has caught several pilots if they go missed early in the procedure, for example out over Elliott Bay prior to Toge, which you cross at 1,600 feet if you're on the glide slope. Even if you go missed, you must continue the descent to 1,500. 
Aircraft flying ILS or RNAV approaches with vertical guidance to runways 16 at Seattle cross Boeing Field at about 2,000 feet. If you climb above 1,500 too soon, you'll at best set off TCAS alerts and RAs. So this is an exception to the rule that you can always climb when you decide to go missed. You just can't turn prior to the missed approach point. Understanding the procedures at Boeing Field requires context. Boeing Field is part of a triad of closely spaced airports, Seattle, Boeing Field, and Renton. Often ATC effectively must treat them as one airport for purposes of IFR separation. Thank you, Bravo Whiskey and Mike Sierra for helping us facilitate that and taking the time to record it. There was one, all of that was really good. There was one comment specifically that I don't, I, I don't want to breeze over. I think we have said on this show that climbing is your friend on missed approaches and implied that that's always your first move. Get away from earth, go up, maybe not turn right away. We agree with you there. Um, again, this is a very unique situation. The 500 feet of separation that could exist somehow is wavered because that doesn't jive with normalcy mm -hmm. in separation of IFR. Yeah. Um, but you're right. You can't just punch the toga button, push the power up, and start climbing. If it was really early, you got to continue down to an altitude that'll pr keep you beneath the over flying Bravo ILSs, and you can't climb away because you're going to go into them early. So, great, great comment. Anything That's, to add that just to that shows one? you how it shows you how important it is to brief the missed approach on on any, you know. And if you're by yourself, brief yourself. Uh, if you're on, if you're in a crew. Um, brief the approach plate and brief the missed uh, procedure because hopefully you would look at that on this particular um, procedure and say, oh, well, that's kind of weird. You know, uh, we could end up descending <laughs> if this happens early enough, you know. Um, so that should hopefully catch your attention. Uh, when you're doing a briefing. Um, I think the tendency now, and I know that we were occasionally guilty of this, um, but for those um, pilots that have an FMS, that they could just load the approach straight into the FMS, and it's, it's showing you the altitudes and everything. There's a tendency, I think, not to look at the plate which you're missing out on really important information. And we mm -hmm. frequently can tell um, on the controller side when that is happening, when they don't have the plate up, because if I reference something from it and they have no idea what I'm talking about, this happens all the time. It happens mm -hmm. from pilots who request an approach. And I say, hey, okay, clear direct to this fix. What, what fix? You know, well, it's on the approach you just asked for. <laughs> right. Which a long time ago we talked about, they could have already activated vectors to final. And a lot of those fixes are poof. They're gone. Right. They're not on the screen. They're not available to, to scroll down to. Um, but you're right. A hundred percent. And that's a note. I have it highlighted on the screen. It's in the middle of this plate. It's not in bold. It just looks like a normal uh, note attached to it. A descent to at or below 1500 may be required when executing an early missed approach. I would probably have that with a box around it, with a warning. I have never seen that on another plate. And yeah, all this talk about it, I didn't realize it was there until I thought, huh, I wonder if they put a note that says that, because this would really get a most, most crews and catch them. And yeah. there it is. It's, it's, it's in the middle of the plate. But, excuse me, it's not on the top part where you would normally start your briefing. It's not down in the mist. It could be easily skipped with all this extra information on the on the plan view uh that you're kind of i don't want to say dismissing but glazing over while you get to the rest of your approach brief so yeah absolutely shall we move on all right All right, this week's show topic is host created. Brought to you it's by not us. From the listener. <laughs> Brought to you by us. Uh, I'm going to say this delicately. 
there have been a lot of high attention, high profile events in the news. And one of the things that drives me crazy is there's no context. We, you don't hear what's going on in the background. You don't get a story from the controller on why they found themselves in that place in time with that scenario. And I feel like on this show, it's a good opportunity to def sort of not defend the, the issues. We're not getting into specifics of those, but try to explain what's happening to arrive at those places, what should be happening and, and how our thought process works before we initiate a squeeze play. So today is the anatomy of a tower squeeze play. Tower. Tower. Yeah. I, Very, I went back and specified that. Yeah. That's an important distinction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we may, perhaps we could do one on a radar squeeze play, which happens a lot more often, uh, I think, than a tower does, at least in our traffic. So, all right. What is a squeeze play? I made this up. You're not going to find this in a book. If you think this I love this definition. Needs... No, no, okay. no. I, I love it. I read through this. Yeah. All right. It sounds like I got it out of a book, but I totally made this up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. When ATC utilizes legal methods of separation that will result in minimum separation between aircraft while being safe, efficient, and predictable. Yeah. Let me let me talk about minimum separation. Okay. Those uh, standards exist for safety. Those are buffers, okay, built in um, so that if there is a, a loss of separation, we're not already so close that it's terrifying, right? Um, so it, it's just a buffer built in. You know, think about it. it. Like for radar, the standard lateral separation of three miles at, at the same altitude well, why isn't it two? I mean, you know, so <laughs> it's just built in buffer. Um, anyway, that's all right. That's all. Uh, let me get number two. And why don't you read ahead a little bit to three and four? If you want to, you can catch those two as I'm, as I'm going through this, I'm kind of loading the gun for three and four here. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So not every situation, at least the triad demands a squeeze play. But at this airport, we utilize the same surface for arrivals and departures. That was something on the news that drove me crazy in the last few months. They cleared an airplane to land on the same runway. They cleared an airplane to take off. Okay, that's 100% normal. <laughs> right. All day. <laughs> that, we don't reserve it for only arrivals between these hours and then departures on these hours. That's not how that works. So, right. Anyway. I mean, uh, that's how it works at places like... Uh, Atlanta, Atlanta. And DFW. There's yes. there are departure runways and there are arrival runways, uh, but that's not how it works at probably ninety percent of every other airport. Yeah. All right. So the decision whether or not you even have a squeeze play starts early. So I'm on local. Let's just pretend AG is on ground control, working as a team. We have information we have to pass on strips. I should have an idea on the local position, what's coming, because he passed me the strip in enough time to formulate a plan based on inbound traffic. So <clears throat> I'm starting to review. I got that strip in front of me. I'm always saying to myself, who is the conflict? I'm not assuming there is no conflict. I'm always looking for one. Who's the conflict? Can I solve it safely? And what methods do I have at my disposal to ensure it works if I decide to run a squeeze play? I can use lineup and wait. I can tell the pilot immediate. I can give them traffic information. I can communicate the situation to the arrival and the departure early, kind of telling the story. Um, where does the aircraft taxing have to be in order for me to make the attempt? In other words, if they don't pass this tax away by this time, this arrival gets to this point, I'm not even going to try this. It's not going to work. Is it rounding the corner? Is it passing a previous tax away? Uh, this is important. Who is the operator? Is it someone that we can trust? I have a list of pilots I don't trust. A uh, smaller list of ones I do trust in a squeeze play, depending on how tight it is. Uh, is it a GA flight that there's instruction? Is it a student pilot on the ticket? No squeeze plays. Not going to happen. Um, how far does my arrival get before I realize it won't work and I can't start the play? Is it four miles? Is it three miles? It depends on their speed. It depends on the winds. Um, and this is a kind of a play that I want to run through all these. Is there a reason for this squeeze play? Can I wait? If I do wait for a larger hole, what's behind this arrival that's creating 
potential squeeze play that could just postpone it to a later point. All of those things that I just said are going through my head when I start to see a sequence from ground. And at our airport, it's they all come in at once, they all leave at once. Yeah. Not unlike a big airport, not as many, but we have to start planning. You have to figure out, all right, this one has a time, we're going to get to that. But I'm, I'm running through all that. I'm not just sitting there robotically clearing airplanes to take off and hoping it'll work. There's a ton of thought that happens before we say clear for takeoff. Go tell ahead, me, sorry. tell us about, tell us what you mean by trust. Do, do I, I trust a pilot or not? Um, because I, um, I feel like that may not be super clear for some, like what you mean by that. Um, all right. I'll give you an example. There I, is an operator on the, uh, trust versus no trust. It's not like, I don't, I trust all the pilots to do their job. I don't want to. Okay. That's what I wanted. Yeah. That's, that's what I was, I was kind of getting at. Like it, it isn't that the ones you don't trust are bad. I agreed. It's right. just that I, I have seen performance that demonstrates that when I need you to go faster or accommodate my wishes at the time, if they're not in line with the procedures I've seen demonstrated over time, I'm not going to introduce that problem to you. Right. I can't trust you to be a, a player in this scenario versus there are a few. They'll tell you as they're approaching. They see that airplane on final. They have a very good idea of our traffic here. And they'll load the gun for you. Hey, we'll be ready at the end. All right, that no delay around so the corner. Important. Yeah, like they have already said, I want to play. Yeah. Let me in. Don't <laughs> right. make me wait. Because right. it's a very short amount of time to make the squeeze play go and be gone. It takes forever to wait for it to be over, where you would not have a squeeze play anymore. And it's like we could have launched you seventeen times. That's what right. it feels like to the pilot, but that's not realistic. So, all right, all right. go ahead. You could. You can run number three and number four here. How about okay, that? Okay, so what do you need to run a squeeze play? Well, you need two. Peop- you need two aircraft. It could be three. <laughs> hopefully not. Well, hopefully not. But you got to have two that are going to be a conflict. And in the tower, this is typically uh, sharing time on the runway is what we are trying to prevent. Okay. <laughs> Or a lat long at the same altitude. Yes, exactly. Right. Or a place in space. Yeah. Sharing a place (laughs) in space. Not That's not acceptable. Um, Sharing time on the runway uh, for for the news agencies out there. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, it is totally normal daily, uh, hourly. For a plane to be cleared to land and one to be cleared to take off on the same piece of pavement, okay? When I say sharing the same runway, I mean they're both physically on the pavement or over the pavement at the same time. Okay, so that's that's typically what we're trying to prevent. Um, the other thing you need is a reason to do a squeeze play. Okay, maybe like for us, we're down to one runway um, that and this next plane has a release time. And if they miss it the next time, it could be an hour. Like that's mm-hmm. a lot of pressure on us because if we don't hit the, this gap that's available, we just delayed that plane an hour. Those people might miss their connections. You know, there's a whole list of stuff starts running through your head like, you know, we got to get this plane out. Okay. And that uh, is probably for us one of the most common um, uses of running a squeeze play is I got to get this guy out. And, uh, you know, knowing, I guess, if, if it's going to work or not. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff that's that could cause... Uh, our crossing runway, there's traffic in the pattern. Um, you're trying to squeeze in a, a downwind in between two arrivals, between two jet arrivals. You're trying to separate from white turbulence with a heavy. Um, you could say you can look out in advance 
and, and say, okay, if I don't hit this gap, I don't have one for three or four more planes. This is becoming very common for us, especially when we're when we're at one runway. Um, uh-huh. I don't think I, I I don't think we realize sometimes how how advantageous it is to be able to put planes on the other side of the airport. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in terms of getting departures out. Um, but when, when it's busy, sometimes there's not a gap. You, you're getting planes, VFRs, two miles in trail, you know, <laughs> they're yeah, watching each other. Wouldn't. They're following each other. Like you're not getting anybody out. You know, by the time the, the first guy lands and gets off the runway, the second guy's on a mile final, and you're not launching somebody in between those two planes. So uh, it can get backed up. Um, so all of that, all of that said, we don't, we're not just running these to run them for the heck of it. We have a reason to do it. Um, if... If it goes bad and someone asks, why didn't you just wait? You need a good answer. Um, And that all goes back into, you know, when the plane's taxiing out, when when ground hands you a sequence of planes, you have to immediately start looking at, what do I have in the air? Who's coming in? Who do I have to get out? Do I have traffic pattern? Do I have, you know single runway crossing operations, what is going on? Um, The other thing you got to think about, does ground need to cross the runway? When can I cross somebody downfield? You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables. Um, I think that pretty much covers number three. Uh, Do you want to talk on four? Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh All right, this is the part that drives me crazy and seeing the, the events unfold with no context. Before we decide to pull the trigger and actually make the squeeze play happen, you've already gone through all the ways to accomplish it legally and safely, but you should have already run through scenarios on, all right, the trusted player doesn't go as fast as I thought they did or should, and now it doesn't work. Who goes around? Which direction are they going to fly? How do I keep that airplane that's on the runway safe? What if there's somebody on the crossing runway? Where do they go? How can I remove the pattern guy from the problem uh, or get them out of the way to allow me to turn somebody? All of those things, and this is what makes training and local control specifically difficult. You can't get in their head to find out if they're going through these scenarios. You can ask, but if you ask too many questions, you're solving the problem for them by yeah, you're leading them into the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So if you say, hey, if if this guy goes miss, where are they going to go? It might be the first time they've thought about that. Well, you mean it's gonna, he's going to go miss? They all land. No, they don't always land. <laughs> Sometimes they go back up and now they're still in your problem. Um, but we've, as local controllers, should have already figured out at a minimum a plan B. And, and yeah. how we're going to dynamically solve it if any of the players... Don't do what we expected. And here's, I hope this is a highlight of the most important thing. You have to know and to accept that it isn't going to work. When do I start cleaning up a mess that I created? In other words, when do I admit that I made a mistake? A lot of controllers are hesitant to do that because you're admitting that you messed up. If you started it and now you have to play cleanup, you messed up somewhere. This is part of the risk that you accept in agreeing to run a squeeze play. Yes. It is an increased, it is an increased opportunity for failure. It could not work. If you wait and delay the guy five, 10 minutes down there and you launch him when there's nothing happening, there's no risk in that. There's no risk in you failing to do that. A lot of controllers will default to that. And it it may not feel like, Hey, you might not be the one to blame. It could be something else. Something happened. Uh, some behavior by the pilot or one of the players didn't fall in line with normalcy. And now it's not going to work. You have to know when to say this isn't going to work. 
and we'll get to this towards the end. Number six is, I'm going to let you have five and six because okay. I'll give too much away, but know when to say it isn't going to work. That's typically earlier is better. Right. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Um, squeeze plays are absolutely necessary. We have to have them. Without them, especially certain airports, it would come to a screeching halt because all they do is run squeeze plays. All day. Now, the difference at those places is that everything is very predictable. It is very consistent. It is professional airline pilots doing the same thing over and over and over. And there is a a reasonable expectation for consistent performance that is not always the case when you start introducing training you know a a training a flight that's clearly a training flight are you going to try to slam them out in between you know are you going to run a squeeze play with a with a training flight probably not that's what we're talking about when when we say trust like okay uh, well one i don't really want to put you in that situation um, it might be a trainable moment, but I don't want to have someone go around for your, for your mm-hmm. training. Right. No. Um, but sometimes this has to happen. Squeeze plays have to happen. Um, yeah. Like you, t- like you said, you can't be afraid to, to admit that, okay, I screwed this up. <laughs> this isn't going to work. You'll hear Let controllers say that. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I'll set the stage. All right. you, let's just make this a two-player dynamic here. An airplane on final, doing a normal predictable jet speed, inside the final approach fix. You can't use Luau, but you have a departure that if you keep moving, he doesn't stop, he's going to go. He or she is going to be able to go. You're going to get your legal separation on the runway which jet to jet is 6,000 feet down the runway and keyword and airborne <laughs> right? air lifted off the ground before the arrival crosses the threshold. Okay. You did it. You know, it's going to work. So it's a bordering on squeeze pilot gets out there and they <laughs> take lunch break stopped on the runway and yeah. don't move. Could be legitimate. Right. Maybe they have an indication. Run, run me that, through, you know, run me through your thought process. You're the local controller. You ran this. You started it. You cleared him, and you're watching them. He's eat on the runway. Lunch. Yes. he's on the runway. Where is my arrival? Yes. They're inside of three miles now. Okay, I have until two. If that jet isn't rolling by the time that arrival is at two miles, we have a problem. This could be a okay, problem. Okay, so how how would you solve that problem? I would tell them traffic inside of three miles. No delay. I would tell the guy on the runway, you have to go. All right. All right. The arrival to got moving. to two miles and the guy didn't start moving. Now what do you do? See, now we're in a squeeze play. Okay. Outside of two, at three miles, I we're in a normal. This is completely normal. It's totally conceivable. I'm not really okay. that worried about it. Now at two, now we're into squeeze play territory. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Every second that happens inside of two miles is really ratcheting up the, this isn't going to work. Right. All right. It's, you've decided the guy on the runway is not moving your binoculars and your eyeballs tell you he is not rolling. Now we're inside of two. Okay. What do you, what do you do? I send the, I tell first number one, cancel takeoff clearance hold position. I don't want two airplanes in the air cuz now they're going to be close together. The set, the Keep guy in final has must to happen. The guy in final has to go around. But instead of allowing that guy to take off and send him around, putting two planes in close proximity in the air, one of which is now like having to convert into go around mode from landing mode, okay? This could be a very busy uh-huh. Uh-huh. crazy time in the cockpit so to prevent 
th that in combination with a, another aircraft in close proximity, I'm going to hold the one on the ground on the ground. You're on the ground. There's no reason to introduce you into, into the problem that's going to be in the air. Okay. I like I am going to preload. Okay. Once this guy starts approaching two miles on final, I am going to preload him with, I need you to be prepared to go around. Okay. Good play. <laughs> so now he's thinking, all right? Now he, he knows. There's another option here. There's another option, okay? If you can squeeze any more speed out of the guy on final. Okay, so if he's doing jet speeds, like I'm seeing 140, 150 ground speed at two miles, mm -hmm. we're pro it's probably not going to work. But if I could get him to slow, like some jets, you know, if I could see 100 knots ground speed, depends on the jet. If it's a 757, they could slow. Like nine. Shoot, he could, yeah, he could get another departure out. Because yeah. <laughs> then it feels like he's a Cherokee on final, you know, and at two yeah. miles, I'm like, no problem. But it just all depends. There's so many variables that you have to take into account. I'll play devil's advocate to get you to okay. number six here. Okay. Well, hold on. He, you told him to go. The guy on the right, he's going to go. He's going to move. Come on. It's going to work. Just Let's just wait to see what happens. He's It's going <laughs> to happen. Okay. What you're he's, saying he's happens gonna roll. all the time. This happens in the tower all the time. Oh, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's just, totally going to work. It's like you saw him move an inch on the runway. Look, he's rolling. This is, this is going to work. Hopefully optimistic. That's, okay. <laughs> that gives us, that brings us to number six. Uh, and I had a commander, one of the best commanders I've ever had. This is when I flew Chinooks early on. He had a saying all the time, and it was in reference to, you know, completing a mission. Hope. Mm -hmm. Hope is not a positive course of action. <laughs> it is also not, not a method of separation, right? So when someone asks, what separation are you using between these two planes? No one says hope. <laughs> now they, they might in practice be using hope, right? Yes. But they're not going to respond. That they, oh, I hope that just, I hope it works out. Okay, let me let me break this down for the non-controller, non-pilot who's never seen this scenario. If you've flown into a busy airport or any airport with arrivals and departures on the same surface, you've seen this hypothetical scenario unfold hundreds of times. If a controller waits to initiate that, I called it delayed solution implementation. <laughs> A yeah. fancy way of saying you're hoping you're you're in yeah. hope mode. Yeah. It the problem gets incredibly worse every second that goes on because now you're hoping the airplane on the runway gives you the desired performance. I get down the runway a mile down the runway. Now you have to make a mile of progress uh, down a runway while the airplane on final is going uh, 150 knots. Let's say. Yeah. Two miles away. There's a math scenario here. Like you don't you do start. Math. You're not at the same speed really until no. the departure is like airborne. Right. So that takes time, right? <laughs> if you delay the solution implementation and then you decide this isn't going to work and the arrival is on a very short final, your departure is just about to rotate. You have created a mess that will get a ton of attention. Maybe they have in the recent past. Right. Hope and waiting is making the problem worse. Cut your losses at two miles. Say go around. You could probably even get a turn in there for the mist, provided you don't have any obstacles or any reason not to, to get them away from the departure if you couldn't get them to stop their takeoff. You know, it was a little bit further down. They're rolling. We, we typically don't reject takeoffs unless they're stopped. That's a rarely used move. Very rare. But if they weren't if they weren't moving, it's totally legit. Like, all right, I'm going to prevent two airplanes from being airborne at the same time. But my point of going back to this is for the ones that want to say, 
well, how, how do you know it wasn't going to work? Because I've seen this. Unpl- I've seen this played out. It's not going to work. Just right. accept it now. Yes. And now the planes will <clears throat> never get close at all. And no one will. Hey, why'd they go around? Psh, guy took forever on the runway. That's a legitimate answer. You didn't do yep. anything wrong. Right. In this. Right. In this scenario. So if you're running a squeeze and hope is part of your plan B and C, uh, yeah, it's the wrong squeeze play to use. Right. I had a trainer in on local that said, if you are not having to go around every once in a while, you're not being efficient enough. That your over, if you never had a go around, your inefficiency, okay, is outweighing whatever inefficiency would be created by a go around, right? So think about it in cost to the operator. You send them around, that's extra, that's extra dollars. They had to fly to come back around and do another approach. But that pales in comparison to all the time you've wasted, people's time that you've wasted sitting there waiting for a bigger gap, for a larger hole to get, you know, airplanes out Mm. um he said it's don't be afraid to have go-arounds and go-arounds happen at airports busy ones constant stream of arrivals there are busy airports that share runways it sometimes it makes the news they have a departure and an arrival runway that's the same piece of pavement and they run squeeze place that happens at big airports too even arrival arrival yeah so yep. when I was at DFW, I watched an arrival miss the high-speed taxiway that everyone else was making. Wah, wah, wah. And the controller didn't even wait. He goes, nope, that is that is a go-around. So-and-so, go-around. Because he just knew. There is no way he makes it down to the next taxiway and turns off. Nope. And they have to be off the that, runway. Right. That takes forever. Solve yeah. it problem early. Yep. Did we share enough about this? All these things that are going through our head. I, th- I think we gave some good examples. Yeah, I think so. That um, when you're watching the news and you're seeing these things unfold, you're only hearing one layer of that mix. You're only hearing the instructions. You're not privy to what was behind them, what was going on in another runway, um, the thought process on what the controller's plan was. There's a ton of other things in the background that don't get talked about. That's what we're trying to do today. Yeah. Yeah. There should be a lot going on in a controller's head prior to this squeeze play happening, evaluating all of these variables. Who are the players involved? How fast can they go? What is my out? What happens if I don't get them out? You know, all of that has to happen in your head very, very quickly. Um, and that that is one of the difficulties as a trainee to to try to gather in all of these variables. It's really yep, and I would it's just situational awareness. It really is really what it comes down to. So Yep, and a good ground controller with a good local controller together, they're having that conversation. They're kind of helping each other work through that. Hey, I'm putting him out here. He's got six minutes left. I see your final. You got he, this. Is your window? It's got to happen now. That type of thing. Or ground is looking out and saying there is no hole for this person. It's impossible for them to go out on this runway. I'm going to put them on the other runway. <gasps> what? A yeah. Carowind went out the right runway. What are you doing? <sighs> I'm planning ahead. <laughs> right. I'm avoiding this. Right. Okay. Um, Did we beat that horse? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I wanted to t- one more thing on release times. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to watch a release time squeeze play develop because the plane sometimes will get down to the end of the runway very early. Okay. Let's say they get down there. They have 10 minutes before their time. There's nothing happening, nothing happening. And now the time is starting to creep up. And we have a cutoff where, like, really before this time, we can't really clear you for takeoff. We, we clear you at the earliest possible time so that you're basically tagging up as early as you can. Without us getting in trouble for releasing. Without us early. getting in trouble, right, for violating your release time. Okay? Right. 
Um, <laughs> and as the time approaches, here comes a plane on final. And you're like, of course. This could, there could be, these are the last two planes in the universe. Okay. And they <laughs> want to come together. <laughs> <laughs> right now <laughs> right in front of me uh so you're now you're looking at okay this guy has you know four miles to go before he's at at three because really at three if a plane isn't on the runway in position like three is kind of now you're pushing mm -hmm. it this mm -hmm. is this is an immediate no delay you mm -hmm. can't sit you can't pull out on the runway mm -hmm. and sit i just need all of this to happen in one fluid motion in fact, if no you breaks. if you went to take off power <laughs> it, before you <laughs> were lined up, that would be fine. We'd be okay with that. <laughs> if you you'd end up blowing the Skyhawk over, you know that was behind you. Uh, but um, sometimes I just thought, like, well, well, maybe somebody's thinking, well. Why did you wait? You know, why, why not just... All right, the inbound guy sees him sitting there the whole time. Yeah. He chose now to clear him for takeoff? Like, Yeah, what? exactly. You're right. Right. The inbound guy's like, what? That guy's been sitting there. <laughs> I, I saw the runway like 10 miles ago, and I saw that plane. <laughs> sitting right sit there. It's just sitting there. Yeah. It's almost yeah. as if they waited to make this as tight as possible. Yeah. <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> Yeah, that's not what's happening. Mm. Anyway. Good point. I'm glad you brought that up. I love this topic. We have never done this mm. one before, really. We've talked about squeeze plays, but we've never really broken it down, I don't think, as much as we did today. So Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'll sleep better tonight knowing we've defended some of the process in the NAS and hopefully enlightened some people like, huh, I didn't realize that. That's hopefully what we got. Yeah. Very good. All right, moving on. Feedback time. Feedback. All right. First one from Patreon Alpha Delta. Send some audio. Hey, RH and AG. This is uh, Patron Alpha Delta to the east in the Duke area. Uh, wondering what the changes in ATC protocol will be with supersonic flight. Really a segue into the big story that was in the local paper this morning that you might want to inform your uh, readers about Triad uh, Airport. Uh, I did have the privilege once of flying on the Concorde. <coughs> and as I recall, it took off like a rocket from JFK. It certainly wasn't a routine um, uh, takeoff. And I wonder what different policies ATC used for supersonic capable planes uh, back then. At any rate, it sounds like uh, you guys are going to have to get up to speed to that, so I'd appreciate hearing what changes, if any, uh, supersonic flight would bring. Thanks. Cool. Uh, one day, there may be an airplane departing from our field that is capable of supersonic flight with passengers. The factory is being built at Triad Airport, which is cool. It is. Uh, let's just fast forward to the day they start operating. In the current set of rules, there would have to be a waiver to go faster than certain speeds below 10,000 feet. There would have to be some sort of waiver, if they ever want it, or change the rules to go over the speed of sound over the domestic United States. Right now, that can only occur over the water, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of reasons, noise being one of them. Yeah, yeah, stuff bit falling off the walls and... I yeah, remember as a boom. kid when that when it wasn't when when you could and military we had a lot of military mm -hmm. jets and we would get uh, sonic booms pretty frequently and you knew it like it's shaking the walls and pictures are falling off and like <laughs> it, it was no joke yeah yeah um, procedurally at a Charlie Airport like ours there would have to be a some instruction on, all right, how fast are you guys going to have to go to accomplish safe flight? That's probably going to be faster. And I believe the Concorde had waivers below 10,000 to exceed 250 knots uh, just to get configured properly to climb in that airplane. Slower flight. I, I say slow, but I don't mean slow, slow. Slower flight is a challenge and 
wasn't in line with their limitations. They were speeding up from the get go uh, to to maintain safe flight. And I be, I would have to assume this airplane is just a concept at this point that they would have a similar limitation of going fast. But uh, we'd we'd there would be a learning curve on watching that unfold on a on a scope. How wide are these turns going to be? You know, when we're used to seeing sub 250 knot behavior below 10, uh, depending on how fast they were, that wouldn't be too crazy. I mean, we see airplanes in our airspace above 10 that are going pretty fast. Um, yeah, it would be an adjustment. Be imp- if they're having to go, you know, 200 knots down final, mm. that is definitely not normal. Mm. <laughs> That's an yes. adjustment. That is an adjustment. Um, you know, for those of you that don't remember or never or never noticed, the Concorde on final had such a high angle of attack, right? It's so nose high to go slow that the nose had to bend. It moved right. physically down so that the pilots could see where right. they were going, Right. So there's a lot of weird stuff that happens with these planes that are capable of traveling that fast because you can't like you can't take a normal plane and make it go that fast without complications and problems. So it has to be designed differently where its envelope for flying normally doesn't it is much it's way farther right on the speed scale um mm-hmm. and it just changes how it you know I I don't think in terms of um, you know, there may be some waivers for below 10 and we may have to adjust for distance on final, you know, for separation and stuff like that. But I don't think really for us in the terminal environment, there'll be a huge impact. You know, it still Agreed. has to, it still has to take off. It still has to use the runway. It's still going to be, you know, same runway separation. Um, and that, that sort of separation, I don't think is going to change really for us. It'll just be yeah. the adjustment to its its speed. I look forward to that day. I hope it happens. When we're launching them, when we launched Honda jets for years, I mean, the better part of the beginning of our careers was Honda test flights. They go up to altitude at a center and sort of no man's land, do their work and come back. That was fun. I, if we can be a part of that with a new airplane that's supersonic and go around the world in a few hours versus a few days, great. Yeah. Be cool. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah, Honda really kind of put us, you know, on the map of of aviation. Um, the Triad is a is very interesting area uh, for aviation, uh, and it's interesting that this company also is, wants to build planes here. So it's pretty cool. Cool. Thank you, Alpha Delta. You want number two? Number two from SCAC patron Mike Charlie high alpha golf and Romeo hotel Mike Charlie from the Oompa Loompa Delta under the Barry Seal Memorial Bravo Barry Seal I know, I know that name Was that the guy Tom Cruise Yeah 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 that was from that movie okay yeah right. <laughs> A few <laughs> A few more lighthearted questions on OB-264. <laughs> AG mentioned the military's UHF radios as a non-military pilot. I've wondered about those for a while. Are there any advantages to UHF versus VHF? Does the military do this so that we don't get to hear all your cool call signs on our plebeian VHF radios? Better quality. <laughs> AFAC? A-fac? As far as I know. As far as I I've see. You guys... You can't do that to me, all right? As far as I know, <laughs> lower frequency equals more range. So are there Hold more? On. I only watched you try to work that for like a second. I, yeah. I came to the rescue pretty quick. I would never have caught it. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> I thought it was a, and I thought it was like a technical acronym, not some ridiculous anyway (laughs) Uh, lower frequency equals more range so are there more problems with reception at distance also oompa loompa ground is more fun to say than on the radio and i've caught myself doing this by mistake (laughs) or twice so far (laughs) Uh, that would be funny so far much 
like when I'd go out to bars in my single days, I've never gotten a phone number. <laughs> Just wondering if this is something that could cause trouble or not the end of the world on a moderately slow delta frequency. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, it's all in good fun. Uh, as far as the UHF, you know, I feel like um, there was some advantage. And yes, lower frequency equals more range, uh, but it also, uh, there's, there are drawbacks to that as well. And I know a lot of the times when we couldn't communicate with VHF, that UHF would work. Um, plus, it's just it, it's just separated from the interference of all the stuff that's happening in the in the VHF band. Um, and I don't know if there's a specific reason that the military got that chunk of frequencies. Um, if it was for that, you know, if it is for some technical reason, or that's just you know, how it ended up working out. I don't exactly know. Um, I do know, though, that they frequently worked better. Um, however, for communicating in the NAS, we never used them. We never used them because it was a pain, and we knew the controllers didn't know the frequencies and had to look them up, and we're not talking on the same thing everyone else is talking on, uh -huh. uh, which is a huge pain. You don't hear what's happening. Some and airplanes in the military don't have VHF, though. Some. That's pretty rare. That's like fighters. Okay. And that's pretty much it. Which is weird to me that it's the fighters. And I remember when this came up, I think it was an F-16 we were working, and they didn't have VHF. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense to me. I would think in a theater that with the communication that's happening between all the busy controllers and other personnel that it would be important to be able to communicate on as many places as possible and to be limited to UHF that confused me I didn't get that but somebody smarter than me will know will will write in will listen and write in and tell us why it is that way mm -hmm. um, I know that encryption is important and I don't know if UHF is more easily encrypted um, mm. the military al also operates in a VHF band that's way lower. So we call it FM, which is down in like the 30s, 29 point something to like 35-ish point something. And that's usually air to ground and ground to ground stuff is those lower, um, really low frequencies. And of course, uh, HF can be like across the world if you have the right equipment and um, I have used the HF radio in the helicopter to talk f to somebody from Oklahoma all the way to Virginia. So really, it, yes, it does work. Um, okay, when you, when you get it set up right. So cool. Any anyway, a person could it's not be standing outside the helicopter when that thing was transmitting. <laughs> for cooking parts of their body unless they wanted some of their bits <laughs> cooked <laughs> okay yeah. thank you mike charlie all right we got one more i know we're long one more uh we got audio from patreon bravo golf hello rh and ag this is bravo golf under the rock and roll bravo or if you're old enough to remember the burning river bravo of course, it doesn't do that anymore, but that's another story. First, thank you for an awesome podcast. It's like a continual, humorous masterclass in aviation and the NAS. Top notch. Okay, I have two separate questions. Number one, I'd love to hear more detail about the infamous strips, particularly at Triad. We've all seen the documentary, Pushing Tin, and how they have these little plastic holders and vertical slanted trays for usage when they're on position. But you guys also paint the picture of like a 1982 dot matrix printer. Is there someone who brings you the strips? Do you self-feed? Who changes the paper? And then anyway, just complete the picture in our minds for that kind of thing. Number two, the second question is about busting a Bravo. 
I know you mentioned you don't often have the shelves and such airspace depicted on your scopes, so I'm assuming if there's no conflict and someone accidentally ends up skirting the outer, outer edge of the Bravo, it doesn't set off like Bravo alarms in the Tracon, does it? I'm asking for a friend. Uh, fun story about that, perhaps, in another feedback. Thanks again for all you do. Bravo Golf. Bravo Golf, I'll answer the first question first. We don't have Bravo in our airspace, so we can't answer this first person. <clears throat> there are controllers at Bravo airports that have to depict that in their sector for whatever reason. They're working VFRs, overflight satellite airports, and they, they may have it displayed. So uh, there's no alarm that goes off, but their eyeballs are working. And here, let's just skip to the part where you solve that problem. The earlier you can get flight following with a Bravo controller, even if it doesn't include initially a Bravo clearance, the better off you're going to be. Communicate that with them. If you think you got away with busting a Bravo by like a millimeter, chances are you're never going to hear about it again. That doesn't mean it was okay, and it doesn't mean that someone didn't see it. It just means you happened to barely skirt it, and maybe they didn't realize you did it. We'll just leave it at that. But try to get flight following and communicate with ATC. Uh, the other thing, the strips. Uh, we've shown the strips before. It's hard on a podcast to explain them. <clears throat> They're actually a, a heat-sensitive piece of... Uh, it's not paper. It, well, I mean, it's, it rips like paper. It's It's similar enough to paper, I guess. Yeah, it's got a glossy f uh, finish on it that is, I don't know the technology to say how this works. It's its a heat printer, right? It, yeah. It sends out a, a like kind of like a laser signal and, and burns it into this paper. Yeah. If you take the, if you take like the end of a pen and rub it enough on this, you will create a black mark from the heat. So as soon as it gets any kind of heat on it, it marks and that's all it's doing is it, I think it's probably lasering maybe. Um, very quickly and it, it happens it's not like a dot matrix uh-uh no it's just no. and it's done it prints a whole strip yeah, and like the the boxes um we have two types of printers now the ones that replace our old white printers we we, we complain about them because they're not as reliable the white ones are like battleships those things never went down they got jammed up sometimes but easily fixed you can kind of track the path of the strip coming in from the back and that that strip is i don't know ten thousand strips in a string that have perforations that the system cuts off automatically between strips it runs out of paper we have to go get a box from a counter or a shelf and load it while that printer is not being used they come out of another printer in the room you just have to walk over there and get them it's like uh, 400 mid, yards that, yeah it's yeah. like 400 mid, yards if that happens it, <laughs> there is no backup printer in the tower when the printer goes out on the mid, you better put paper in there. You are not getting those strips again. They're going into nowhere land. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, there's a way to load it. It says which way to uh, put the paper. Typically, that's the controller working the desk uh, in radar or flight data, or a supervisor will come over and change the paper in the tower. It's typically the person in charge, ground controller, clearance. I will go over and change it. That only takes a few seconds. Um, it's not dot matrix that used to be the case though. Yes. They would print out left to right, not, you know, long ways into a, and you had to rip them apart. The plastic, we get a lot of crap for this from people who come in from other facilities. We don't use strip bay holders in the tower ever. No, we don't use them downstairs for departure strips. They come out. We're done with them in a second. It will be stuffing a strip for no reason than unstuffing it. It's a waste of time. For an overflight, the center pushes a button that amends that flight plan like 47 times. Yes. So we'll get amendment, amendment, amendment. That would be somebody's full-time job, pulling out the strip, putting in the new one, pulling out the strip, putting in a new one. Versus a center, they do use those. They're displayed, at least the ones I've been in, I've toured. They display these strips. They're bigger. They have more writing surface. Their D side is writing on them. They're utilized in more planning than they are in ours. Our first time that we really care about that strip is pulling it over and they're flashing at us, working at it versus there might be a little more notes put on a center strips. Yeah. But those are kept in a place where everybody can write on it. We don't, we don't use the plastic strip holders. No, we did when we had a drop tube where yes. you actually put it in a tube and it went flying down and, came shooting out into the tray 
as right. the rolling now we have call. a barcode. Yes. Now we have a barcode that we scan. It goes beep beep, and then it prints out downstairs to prevent there having to be a three hundred yard tube. Man, that would have been fun. That's one thing I do wish we would have seen. Yeah, I would have had a lot of fun with that. Uh, you're going to let me put heavy objects into this tube that just launches into the Tracon? Yeah, 80 feet oh, downstairs, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that enough about strips? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, yeah. okay. the, the holders from the days where they were just paper, thin paper, like, I get it then, because this thing is, like, flimsy and you know, it's fairly fragile. These that we have are pretty rigid. It's like a thick card stock almost. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's fine without, without the holder. And it's easier to write on them because we have a writing surface. It's just a desk in front of us between us and the scope. Yeah. If you had a piece of plastic, you'd have to hold that plastics. You can get away with one handed, you know, you're using your uh, trigger hand to push your button. Cause I'm not a foot pedal guy. I know you are. You can write with one hand and hold the strip in one place. It's very hard, though. You have to have the right pen. You need the, it. The desk you need is like a yeah. The desk is too slippery. You need a some sort of rubber grippy. Where did you put that? You brought right. it in one day. No, no, no one liked it. No, they didn't like it. They threw I did. it away. Okay, well, you were, it was you and me. That was it. I was very offended. <laughs> I'll never bring AG it back. AG walks around with this oh. little desky. He's just right. sit down with. It. <laughs> <laughs> all right we do not have a new question of the week we have feedback prior to february 2nd 2023 right on the show we went long we will tell you when you're going to be on the show or we respond to via email please keep sending your feedback to feedback at opposing basis.com hey g anything before we close i don't have anything all right closing out episode 271 of opposing bases air traffic talk romeo hotel and alpha golf goodbye everyone Visit OpposingBases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at OpposingBases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.